The most bizarre story that I've read in a reputable newspaper <clears throat> in the last month is the one about scopolamine ah. on the streets of Paris. Ah. Do you know about this? Presumably? No, 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 tell me more. So okay, scopolamine so is, is an... Yeah, go on. This is an aerosol which you can basically spray into somebody's face. They will immediately do whatever you like. And when it wears off, they will have no memory of what happened. And this has been being used by... Chinese, allegedly, but, you know, who knows, could be anybody, uh, 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 gangs to rob rich French people of their jewellery. The rich people take them home, they give them all their jewellery, uh, they have a bit of a headache afterwards and they wonder where their jewellery has gone. That's it. And this was, as I said, this was a news report. It was not April the 1st. It was in the Telegraph, I think. So do you know anything about this? Um, that's been going around for a while. There are different versions of this. Part of the problem is the drug delivery. Certainly... I personally know of a case of people who are getting married in Japan were being offered free drinks and then suddenly it's 36 hours down the line and bad things have happened to them. But that was drug delivery through a drink. Through the face, the aerosol, that's harder and I don't know, I'd, I'd have to chase up further on that one. The trouble is the problem of the so-called anaesthetic bomb, where the bomb is rolled into the room and all of the guards just fall unconscious and they get exactly the right amount of dose so that they are not dead and not conscious. And that's the trouble with delivering it through the spray, but they probably don't care. I don't know. I don't know. It's possible. It's more likely through drinks. It is possible, if, especially if they don't care about your well-being. Uh, one, one here from front, thank you. This question has nothing to do with your talk, but I wonder why right-handed people favour their right side when they're presenting to an audience. You never looked at me at all. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to apologise. <laughs> um, I don't... Ona Gertingen. I am not a specialist in anything. I know enough to know what I don't know. And Ona Gertingen, our left-right man, he would either know the answer or would start up a, a study into that. So that's the second thing I failed on. Next one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, look, look, to make up for my crime, I'd like to offer you this fabulous book. <laughs> And I'll autograph it for you later. And I deeply apologise. But on the other hand, owner Gerding is... I'll sign it for you personally. Thank you. House of Carls. <laughs> okay, next one. Thank you. Uh, hi. I, I was really hoping to hear about dropping the cat. Um, and not that I want to come across as a sort of non-cat lover. But how can you drop a cat from 32 floors rather than six? There's a seven-minute video and it's 12 past the hour. We don't have the time, do we? Sorry? I mean, we can have a vote, if you like. How many people want to see the seven-minute video? It's won prizes all around the world. <laughs> okay. Science has proven that cats do have nine lives. It's safer for a cat to fall from a 32-storey building than from a seven-storey building. Now, in New York, most of the people live in high-rise buildings. This combination of humans, high-rise buildings, birds flying past open windows, cats and concrete pavements gives a ready-made environment to test the aerodynamics and impact resistance of falling cats. The cats were not deliberately thrown out of high-rise buildings. They jumped out by themselves. At least, that's what the owners of the cats said when they took the cats to the local animal hospital. Over a five-month period, 132 cats fell from buildings and ended up in hospital. It was raining cats at about one cat per day. No dogs were included in this experiment. Two vets at the hospital examined and repaired the fallen felines and then looked back and analysed their figures. They found that the average fall was five and a half storeys and that 90% of the cats survived. They also noticed that at low altitudes, the number of injuries depended on the height of the fall. If a cat fell from two storeys, it had a 25% chance of getting one broken bone. But as the height increased, the energy that the cat had to dissipate increased, 
And of course, there were more broken bones. All very reasonable. Then the statistics showed something very funny. As the cats fell from even greater heights, they broke fewer bones. A cat falling from 32 storeys had only a 10% chance of breaking a bone. So it was safer for a cat to fall from 32 storeys than it was from 7 storeys. And in fact, 7 storeys was the most dangerous height to fall from. Now the reason that you fall when you jump out of a window is because gravity sucks. If there was no atmosphere, you just keep on falling faster and faster. But we do have an atmosphere and wind resistance does slow you down. When the suck of gravity is balanced by the resistance of the wind, you're now travelling at what is chillingly called the terminal velocity, your top speed. This speed depends on the size and weight of the falling object. For a human being, the terminal velocity is about 200 kilometres per hour. But a cat is lighter and fluffier, and it has a terminal velocity of roughly 100 kilometres per hour. Now we do know that cats are magnificent athletes, and within the first metre of a fall, they twist and turn in space so that all four feet are pointing downwards, and then they begin to accelerate. The common house cat reaches its terminal velocity, or top speed, after about five storeys. Now, so far, everything we've talked about is fact. But if we want to answer the eternal question of why it's safer for a cat to fall from a very tall building, we have to enter the land of theory. For the first five storeys, the cat is still accelerating. And it knows it, and is worried. By the fifth storey, it's reached 100 kilometres per hour, its top speed, and once our plunging pussy realises that it's not going to fall any faster, it relaxes. But it takes at least a third of a second to realise this, and by that time, it's fallen past the seventh floor, and that's why seven storeys is the most hazardous height to fall from, because our falling cat is really, really tense. But the longer it falls, the more it can chill out. If the cat is relaxed, it'll be in a state of dynamic tension. And if it's had time to get perfectly lined up, all four paws will hit the ground at the same instant, spreading the impact. They'll pass the shock up through the four legs. The bones will absorb some of the energy of the impact by bending, but they won't break. Tendons, ligaments and muscles will all absorb more energy by stretching, but not tearing, in our relaxed cat. A squillionth of a second later, the rib cage hits, and so the rest of the energy is spent bending, but not breaking, the ribs. But this raises three issues. First, be careful when you next visit New York. It's raining cats at one a day. Second, it's not fun to fall from a tall building. So, make sure your cat keeps his feet on the ground, and make sure you do too. And third, maybe the cats didn't jump after all. Maybe they were pussed. Wow. Pussed. Oh, that's such a bad pun. Sorry. Uh, we've got a few more minutes for questions. Uh, did that answer your question, by the way? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, now, we, we, we've sort of lost some momentum there. Oh, by the way, another question. Oh, oh yes, thank you so much. Why is the uterus your favourite organ, then? Um, when I was doing obstetrics and gynaecology, um, I suddenly realised for the first time the true intricacies of what was going on. And so you've got something this big, which then swells to take and sustain the life of a human baby, something the size of a shopping bag. And by the way, if you want to gross out the kids, let them know that for the first nine months of their life, they're floating around drinking and excreting their own urine. Hey, you drank your own urine for the first nine months of your life. Yeah, that's what amniotic fluid is. And then, when the, during the later stages, the uterus via the placenta is feeding, I think, I think the figure is 300 mils of blood every minute to the baby. And then during a typical delivery, which I believe can last for more than a few minutes, it might even be painful, um, <laughs> can, the blood loss is half a minute's blood supply because of the beautifully evolved arteries, which are spiral arteries. And the moment there's any compression, it begins to 
tighten on these arteries and cut, cut down the blood supply. So you lose so much, so little life. And then the other thing was a handy hint. Told me that if you were to come across a woman who has just delivered a baby and the baby's well and she's bleeding to death, all you have to do, not all you have to do, but sometimes, sometimes you can make things better by rubbing the tummy. And the rubbing of the tummy will stimulate receptors in the uterus, which will then make it contract even more. And just rubbing the tummy can bring it back to life and not die. And at that moment, I fell in love with the uterus and became my number one favorite organ. Does that answer your question? Thank you. A bit of a downer there, yeah. Oh, by the way, my wife makes all my shirts. That's an, answering that question too. Uh, for the thread overlock, a differential feed, two pockets. Um, what one question that you do not know the answer to, would you most like to know the answer to? Oh. Something as simple as why is the moon bigger on the horizon? And this typical answer goes into a whole lot of stuff about comparing it to other objects on the horizon. But pilots who are flying across the ocean will see the moon rise. Just looking at you to make sure that you're not feeling left out. We'll see the moon rise with nothing to compare it to. And they swear it's bigger and then they look above. So that's one. And also, why, uh, is there life anywhere else out there? Uh, that would be another good one. Um, and, and the Higgs boson, if they can, use, if can work out how to remove mass from an object. Imagine being able to move spacecraft at the speed of light. Wow. Okay, next question. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned the Higgs boson, mm -hmm. and it seems we spent a lot of money on something which seems to be quite inelegant to me. You just smash things together harder and harder and harder and harder. Is there another way of doing it? Um, yes and no. When you say a lot of money, the amount of money spent on building it and employing all those scientists. And it was a good thing to employ those scientists because... Some of them were left over from the Soviet Union and who could have gone into making nuclear weapons and the like. Here's a little handy hint. If you graduate in astronomy or astrophysics, put down on your passport that you are an astronomer because you're just somebody who looks through a telescope. Do not put down that you're an astrophysicist because then you know how to make nuclear weapons and you'll be on a watch list. <laughs> Don't say I told you. Nevertheless, so the, it mopped up all of those scientists who could have potentially been involved in bad things. And the total cost to discover this fundamental thing, which is going to change things in the future, the total cost was less than the cost of three American B-2 bombers. So if the media tells us, I love you Daily Mail, that something that costs less than three warplanes which have got no other job than to drop bombs on people and kill them, is too expensive, then perhaps there's something wrong with the values in our society. Secondly, what use is it? We've got no idea. In this building, the Royal Institution, downstairs is the first electric motor made by the human race. Michael Faraday. I'm just getting all emotional. Grown men and women have been known to burst into tears when they see it. Three things. Let me tell you the three things. A wire, a metal wire... Just looking at you again. A metal wire <laughs> with electricity flowing through it, number one. Number two, the metal wire is moving. Number three, a magnet. Any two will make the third. Michael Faraday had the genius to see it and build it. So you get a metal wire, you run electricity through it, and you have a magnet, and suddenly the wire will move. The third thing, the wire will move. You call it a motor. That could have been done 2,000 years ago. The Chinese had the load, L-O-D-E, stone, where they would get a stone, a magnetic stone, and chip a long spike off it, and then with spider web, put it onto a bit of wood, a very small piece of wood, and float it in a bowl, and that was their compass. And 2,000 years ago in Iraq, Mesopotamia, meaning literally between the rivers, they had... And by the way, there's a story about that in my first, next book about the world's oldest written complaint letter, 4,000 years old. Back then, they had electric batteries. We think they used them for electric, electroplating. We had magnetism 
electric batteries and metal wire. And nobody had the genius of Michael Faraday to see how to turn it into a motor. In the same way, right now, it is obvious how to use the Higgs boson, how to use it to remove mass. We just can't see it. And yet, your children or your grandchildren will be playing with the Higgs boson as a toy. And you'll be saying to your grandchildren, come inside and stop playing with the dark matter and the dark energy. <laughs> so it will have a use further down the line. What, was that the question, actually? No. no. <laughs> the, qu the question was, we're just smashing things together. Mm. Is there an easier way? using... Other techniques? There, yes, there will be, but we, can't see, we, we have to walk before we can crawl, and we have to go the long way around to see the easy way. We will become a space-going race. We will have fusion energy. To provide the electricity that we need on Earth, we don't need nuclear. We can do it entirely with renewables. An area, 50 kilometres by 50 kilometres, covered one-third only with solar cells, one-third to allow maintenance and shadowing, would provide all of Australia where you get the drop airs with electricity, and 500 kilometres by 500 kilometres would supply the whole world. We just need to do it. But we do need fusion engines for space travel. And there are better ways coming. And there will be a better way. We just can't see it. Our eyes are blind. Imagine my, being Michael Faraday two, <coughs> one hour before he had his insight. That's where we are now. Yep. Oh, thank you very much. Um, what colour do you see the dress? And is it true that young children see the black and blue rather than the white and gold? Ah, hello, is that a human person? <laughs> uh, how old are you? 13. 13. Um, can you can come and get your book later for asking that deep question? That has not been done. It is not reported why we do that. Now, I'm talking about the sciencey thing and the travelly thing and the alcoholy thing. And you've asked a very deep question. There is a saying in science, it is not the answer that gets you the Nobel Prize. It is the question. And that is such a deep question. And that fits into visual electrophysiology, neuroscience, don't know. Don't know. Um, but somebody will work out the answer and it could be you. And you might even, if you do it, well enough, you might even get yourself not just a Nobel Prize, by it, but an Ig Nobel Prize. I myself have won an Ig Nobel Prize for my groundbreaking research into belly button fluff and why it's almost always blue. <laughs> there will be payoffs, I assure you, there will be payoffs. I funded it totally myself. And Harvard University showed me so much respect. They flew me all the way from Sydney to Los Angeles to Harvard at my own expense. They would not... <laughs> They would not insult me by offering me money, and you one day could win, besides a Nobel Prize, an Ig Nobel Prize. Come and get this fine book and you'll learn how. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about the, the, the kind of the absurdity of what's going on with fossil fuels, and you talked about how in China there's finally a sort of shift away from that. Is there a tipping point in a non-democratic society when people will finally wake up and begin to act according to the kind of philosophy you've espoused? If you read the book by Naomi Oreskes, Merchants of Doubt, uh, you'll see that there is a very powerfully funded deliberate disinformation campaign by the fossil fuel companies, according to her book. In 1972... Munich Re, the world's largest insurance company, recognised that global warming was real and put it, factored this into their insurance premiums. Every insurance company factors it into their premiums. They see it, they, they're not, they're, they're, they, they deal with the bottom line. It took the scientists a bit longer. They needed a higher burden of proof. That was 1988, the tipping point. That goes back to what our 13-year-old colleague said about psychology in the brain. We humans, as an evolutionary survival thing, are better at dealing with what is urgent than what is important. It is urgent that I rescue you from the killer whale, but it's important that I make sure that you get an education. And always we go for the urgent thing. I can see two scenarios. Okay, assume that the media continue this disinformation campaign and... 
assume that the internet does not kick in enough. And I'm hoping the internet will via the next generation. By the way, two messages of hope. Number one, the kids of uh, a nine IQ point smarter than their parents. It's called the Flynn effect. And secondly, uh, we are living in the most peaceful time ever in human history. Read that book by Stephen Pinker, The Better Angels of Our Nature. So, assuming that, so there's a message of hope. So, assuming that we do not get the media wa- re- recanting on their abysmal position, we'll need an emergency. I don't want an emergency. Bad things will happen. People will die. As a medical doctor, I hate it when people die. People will die. The two emergencies are number one, the Gulf Stream will switch off. It's been weakening over the last half century. It switched off, I think, for. 2004 in October for 10 days and it switched on again afterwards. We do not know why it switched off. We do, we, know what, we do know why it switched off. We don't know why it switched on again. If it had switched off and stayed off, you could not grow crops in Europe and England, the United Kingdom, and you would have to migrate to the Middle East. You would be refugees. How's that for a twist? <laughs> Number two, we're dropping the ice. Going from 1979... To 2012, the amount of volume of the ice in the Arctic we have lost is not 8% or 18, but 80, 80%. You won't read this in the popular press. When we get down to 0% ice in summer, and we don't know when that'll be, but the curve is devastatingly sharp at the moment. When we get down to 0%, by that single act of exposing 2% of the Earth's surface to the sun, not as white reflective ice, but as black absorbent water. It will absorb heat rather than reflect it. That single event will, under a positive feedback loop, cause more than twice all the global (coughs) warming that has happened in human history from when we started burning stuff until we lose the ice in summer. I hope that doesn't happen because things will get very expensive. And remember, it is more expensive to do nothing. It is cheaper to do something. Think about the people in in, in England who are dying of air pollution. In, in, In the Hunter Valley, in the Hunter Valley in Australia, I know people who have to, on a sunny day in Australia, dry their clothes in the dryer. Why? Because there's so much pollution coming from the open cut coal mine. Is the coal miner paying for their electricity bill? No. Should they? Yes. What's it called? Hidden externality. I don't know. But I'm optimistic because our next generation are nine IQ points smarter. The Flynn effect. Look it up. I've got a free to go to drcarl.com and you'll see the story about it there. Flynn effect. Or uh, also in uh, the fact that we're getting uh, more peaceful times. It's a bit of a downer, that one, sorry. (laughs) One final question, and there's one just up there waiting. Uh, Waiting, waiting. Hello? Hi. Uh, Is it true that uh, hot water freezes faster than cold water, and is it true that no one knows why? Mpemba effect, M-P-E-M-B-A, a a penniless Nigerian student in the 80s um, found that water that had been boiled or making ice cream, it froze faster if it had been boiled than not. It seems to be real. It seems to be real. It seems that we don't know why. Um, It could be that the water has been deoxygenated slightly. There's the Henry effect, Henry's law. Henry's law, which is that um, the amount of gas in a liquid is highest when the temperature is low and lowest when the temperature is high. So there's lots down the Antarctic, when, in the Arctic where the temperature is low, there's lots of oxygen in the water, huge amount of biolife, krill. When the temperature is high, like when you're boiling water, the oxygen gets driven off, which is why you should not boil the water for tea. I've had tea in Darjeeling. They do not boil it. They bring it almost to the boil, and then you know, they switch off immediately. If you boil off all of the oxygen... Uh, then you don't have enough oxygen left to bring back the essential flavours from the tea. And so, yes, we do not know why the Mpemba effect happens, but we think it's real. There's an article about it in the American Journal of Physics, I think, a couple of months ago. We still don't know. And Deborah? Ah. Okay. 
we've run slightly over, but... Sorry. No, it's, it's great. 33 it's past great. the Lots hour. Of Sorry. Questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot for all your questions, and thank you, Dr. Carl, for a fantastic talk. <laughs>